Good evening, everyone, and hello. I'm Helen Daly. Welcome to the Commonwealth Bank's CEO Customer Forum. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting today. I'm coming to you from Sydney, and I acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Thank you for joining us this evening. For the last four years, Matt Common, the Chief Executive of Commonwealth Bank, has written to customers to give them an update about the actions the bank has taken to support them and their communities throughout the year. Now, Matt has also held public customer forums for customers to have the opportunity to speak directly with him and the leadership team of the bank to talk about what is on their minds. While an in-person forum unfortunately was not an option again this year, Matt and Angus Sullivan, who leads the retail bank, still wanted to give customers a way to ask questions and give feedback. And that's what this virtual forum is about this evening. More than 1,000 customers have registered to watch the forum and over 600 questions, comments, complaints and other feedback were submitted. Now, the bank's customer relations team has already begun following up with customers to help investigate and resolve complaints and issues. Given the overwhelming number of questions received, unfortunately, we won't be able to answer every individual question in the hour we have together in this forum. So we've grouped the questions we've received into themes, and I'll be posing several of your questions from each of these areas to both Matt and Angus, so you can hear what they have to say. I'll do my best to get as many of your questions answered as possible. So let's get started. Matt and Angus, welcome to you both. Thank Thanks. you for joining me on this customer forum. Matt, would you like to say a few opening remarks? I would, Helen, and thank you very much. And really just to echo some of your comments. Before I do that, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians on the land we're meeting today, as you said, Helen, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respect to, respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Look, it's a great opportunity to, to uh, have be able to answer your questions. As Helen said, we would love to be able to meet in person. Hopefully next year we'll be able to do more of that uh, throughout different parts of the country. But we really appreciate uh, not only uh, our customers are able to join us uh, this evening to, to watch this, but also those who've taken the time to pass on their comments, thoughts, uh, feedback, and, and certainly some things for us to be focused on. It's a, an invaluable tool for myself, Angus, and the broader leadership team. We recognise it's been a really difficult uh, 12 or 18 months uh, for, for many Australians living with the uncertainty, uh, the health impacts, as well as, um, I guess, the broader pressures on both personal and, and professional lives. We've been hugely focused on trying to provide an enormous amount of support to our customers and, of course, uh, the broader economy. We've been delighted uh, of the more than 160,000 customers that we offered home loan deferrals. Uh, the vast majority of those have come out of those deferrals because, uh, as many people know, the Australian economy has performed much better than we had, had feared uh, in early 2020. But we also recognise this is still a difficult and uncertain time. Uh, and we want to continue, of course, to provide that uh, leadership and support to our customers, but also very focused on making sure we continue to improve our products and services and uh, appropriately uh, reward our customers uh, for banking with us. And uh, for each of the 10 million or so retail bank customers, we're very grateful uh, to be able to serve each and every one of you. And as Helen said, we'll do our very best between Angus and I uh, to answer as many of your questions as we can over the next hour. Let's get into it. We will talk COVID, we will talk some of the perennial issues that uh, you do get asked a lot about, lending rates, mortgages, what's going to happen to interest rates, that sort of thing, call centres. But let's start with sustainability because it was interesting. This is the theme or the issue that really you got, you received the most questions mm -hmm. about and it really, um, it, there's a, it, Customers are coming at it from a number of ways. So I'm going to group together a few, as I said to you at the beginning. So Susan and Julie, Deirdre, and a few others did ask about this. And the way Susan put it is, why is the Commonwealth Bank continuing to fund the fossil fuel industry, including companies such as Woodside, Santos, New Hope and Whitehaven, 
despite paying lip service to the Paris Agreement. When will the bank respect customers' wishes and say no more? And look, as you said, Helen, this is a very big and important topic and um, we're increasingly seeing questions from our customers. Of course, uh, we get questions at our annual general meeting from shareholders. And as you'd appreciate, we also, with more than 40,000 of our own uh, team members, get a lot of questions as well. It's a big, broad topic, but and maybe there's a few elements that we, if we get the chance, we can unpack. I mean, I think specifically to where that question, which is really around financing of uh, fossil fuels, we are committed to Paris and uh, achieving the goals uh, within that limiting uh, temperature change uh, to well below two degrees and net zero by 2050. Um, we have seen and have, we have shown year on year that our uh, exposure or lending exposure to fossil fuels, oil, gas, uh, coal, metallurgical coal, have reduced year on year. Um, from our perspective, we've been very clear that we want to support the economy to transition and for companies and Australia more broadly to decarbonise. Uh, when we look at our overall uh, lending or our balance sheet, we have a trillion dollar balance sheet, less than 2% of that is to fossil fuels. So whilst we recognise that it's a really important topic for for some customers, we actually think the impact and the work that we can do in sustainability is much larger uh, than simply reducing what is already a very small proportion of our uh, of our business to fossil fuel. And perhaps if there are questions along that line, I don't want to start off the first question with making a speech. That, but there's a there's a lot of elements to what we're doing. But uh, what I want to make extremely clear, and we put a lot of effort into the annual report disclosures, is our commitment. Uh, to Paris. Uh, we recognise that. We've seen year-on-year -year reductions. We've reduced our own emissions by more than 40% over the last uh, several years. And there's a huge strategic focus for the Commonwealth Bank to play a leadership role in Australia's economic transition. Well, Philip, another customer has asked uh, in a slightly different way, why does the bank continue to invest in the fossil fuel industry? 106, uh, sorry, 16 billion in the past five years. Don't your risk managers tell you that this is a risky area and that you may be left with stranded assets? Yeah, that's 16 billion. I think that might be from an external source. We don't recognise that, but it's on. Uh, it's in a section in, I can't remember the actual page number in the annual report, but it sets out what's known as the energy value chain. And you can see our exposure uh, to all of those sectors and it's well below that. We're very clear about where we will and won't provide financing. Uh, the alignment and also what we're looking for in terms of uh, the companies that we're financing, their commitments and their transition paths that are consistent uh, with Paris as well. But we also think, and, and, and I'll, Angus can talk about this uh, as well, as I said, it's such a small part of our business. Actually, one of the most important things that the Commonwealth Bank can do to support Australia's transition uh, is work on scenarios that are specific to Australia. A couple of weeks ago, we announced a partnership with the CSIRO, which is the Australian sort of peak science body. We're developing scenarios specifically for Australia across a range of different sectors. Uh, given the size of our retail bank, it's really important that we're able to support customers' uh, decarbonisation through a number of innovative products that we've invested in from allowing customers to track their own emissions, a whole range of green financing, uh, which enables people to be able to fund at 0.99%, so less than 1% on a 10-year fixed rate loan to be able to uh, finance things like solar panels, uh, batteries. And so it's very much for us a whole of bank approach. Uh, we report on it annually. It's a huge strategic focus. We see it as, as an opportunity uh, for Australia and the Commonwealth Bank uh, more broadly. But we also recognise that we, you know, we want to support companies that are able to make that transition. Right. You, you talk about transition mm -hmm. and, and some of your uh, customers have asked around that, but some have put it in a perhaps a more positive light, although they've, they've given you a threat here. Robert says, I have $100,000 in savings in the Commonwealth Bank. Will you take notice if I withdraw that and deposit it in a legitimately green bank? Well, I mean, every deposit and every customer account relationship is really important to us. I mean, we wouldn't necessarily accept a characterisation that we're, that we're not. We, we are Australia's leading bank. Uh, we believe we have a role to support uh, Australia's broader economic interests. Uh, 
we have a very limited exposure to fossil fuels, but there are companies within those sectors that are making very significant uh, investments to be able to support their transition. Our role is to support companies who want to make that transition to be able to, as well as being able to provide a whole range of different uh, tools as well as capability to support our retail customers, our agricultural customers, you know, our property construction customers. We have to you know, recognise that um, whilst it attracts a lot of the attention, um, you know, certainly, it's, as I said, less than 2% of our lending is in areas that are you know, commonly associated with most of these questions. In, so you're talking in oil, oil and gas and Oil and, and gas, coal. <coughs> coal, which either you know, thermal coal or metallurgical coal, yeah. which is... Less than 2% of Less than 2% of lending. our trillion dollar balance sheet. Um, which, but we recognise it's also, it, it's a focal point mm. globally. Um, and so that's why we're committed to, and we do report each year. And as I said, for many years, those exposures have been uh, going down. We want to be guided by science. We want to act in the best interests of Australia. And you know, we recognise and we think it's you know, fantastic how much momentum is broadly in this uh, particular area. And of course, both from a government perspective and on the back of COP26, it's one of, as I said, one of the key strategic focus areas for yeah. us uh, in the leadership group of the bank. It is interesting that, and I'm, I'm continuing with these questions because it was the biggest area mm. that attracted your customers' um, comments and questions. Robert and Malcolm, two customers, they've turned it more on about um, investing in the positive, in their view, in renewables. So mm -hmm. um, should CBA not be investing in clean future technologies to give our children a future, asks Robert. And Malcolm sort of adds to that, why don't you look for companies or a company working to produce hydrogen from clean electricity uh, and see if you can offer support? Yeah, look, I, so I, I totally agree with the sentiment of the question. We actually, about three or four weeks ago, we had a, a, an institutional, largely client conference. And so we had um, Alan Finkel, who used to be the chief scientist mm -hmm. for Australia, was presenting. And obviously he's been instrumental in the government's technology roadmap. We actually had one of the... Uh, the leading groups from um, that's supported by Andrew Forrest with the uh, Future Industries Initiative, talking about specifically around green hydrogen. We have uh, bankers and teams of bankers in individual sectors that want to support carbon capture and sequestration. Obviously, uh, solar and renewable. And Angus, maybe you should talk in a second about some of the work we're doing to help our clients. But you know, we're already banking. Uh, a number of customers in those sectors. We're certainly committed to increasing our exposure and we want to uh, support both business, institutional and of course retail customers. And we do think there'll be some tremendous business models and, in, and innovation that's going to be generated, it needs to be, yeah. uh, over the next five to 10 years and, and well beyond. And so from our perspective, we want to be absolutely at the forefront. We had about 500 of our institutional and, and uh, corporate clients that day hearing from a range of different uh, experts. And alongside when we talk to our business customers, it's a huge focus for them. They yeah. recognise both from the, the risks, but also the opportunities. Mm. Angus, could I bring you in here? And I'm just going to put one question to you, but obviously Matt asked you to comment on a few things. Peter says, as a farmer, customer of and shareholder in the CBA, I ask, when will you cease funding climate destroying fossil fuels? So yeah, so maybe the same theme, but from a farmer's point of view. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for the question, Peter and Robert, to your question beforehand as well. Maybe building on a couple of the comments that Matt made, uh, a few areas where we're putting a lot of effort at the moment in the spirit of your question of where can we do more to help the transition. Uh, our green loan that Matt mentioned beforehand is a loan available to all CBA customers who have a mortgage with us. That's just been under 2 million Australians. And that provides the opportunity to borrow up to $20,000 that Matt mentioned at 0.99% uh, fixed for 10 years, pay back early at any time. So it's an incredible value offer. And that's to support Australians who want to put solar panels on their roof or maybe they want to invest in a battery or a more efficient uh, hot water system for their home or uh, different types of energy saving devices. That's a fantastic opportunity. We've seen a lot of customers take it up and get fantastic outcomes with it. Uh, some of you may have heard of our partnership with Amber Electric, which is an energy retailer, uh, very uh, different type of energy retailer who passes on the wholesale prices of energy. 
And certainly when you have the opportunity to bring together your solar panels and or a battery in the future, and their retailing model around energy, there's a really great opportunity for our customers not only to make a huge difference for the climate, but also to save themselves money. And then as Matt mentioned, uh, we've got a great partnership around carbon tracking that we're rolling out uh, into our app that helps all of our customers track how much they're spending by all the different things they have with us, how much that's adding up to in terms of carbon emissions. And as Matt mentioned, uh, great opportunities for us to support Australia and the transition in the Australian economy using the areas where we want carbon capture to take place or uh, carbon credits for farmers, in particular in your case, looking to commercialise some of their land back to retail consumers who are looking to offset uh, some of their emissions as well. So I think there's a great opportunity, especially in the agricultural space, to tap into the innovation that's taking place. Matt, so I just want to be mm -hmm. clear. Uh, you mentioned transition, mm -hmm. and I know you and uh, the chairman have talked about this a lot, that you're helping companies transition. So can you clarify for those several questioners, those several customers who want you to just stop funding fossil fuel industry, will you still be financing, say, oil and gas projects, including some new ones? Yeah, so what we've set out... In this transition? Well, as part of the, um, our annual report, which obviously was uh, a source of many of the questions at the AGM, we're very clear and you can go through each of the criteria where we will support. Well, we have seen exposure come down. We make it clear where we'll support customers at a corporate level where we're actually lending to the institution versus project <laughs> finance. And some right. of the questions that you're asking about are similar to some of the questions we had at the AGM, which customers or, or indeed shareholders are asking, will we fund a project which is currently in, in exploration by an individual uh, company. We, we've made no commitment to fund any of those projects. And so we have very clear criteria, including um, the criteria that are not only consistent with Paris, but also support broader transition. So it's not a straight answer of yes or no. What we have seen, as I said, is our exposures continue to reduce. We don't think it would be in Australia's best interest to just stop lending to all of those sectors immediately. We don't think that's the responsible thing to do. But we're totally committed to uh, what we've said around uh, Paris. And we believe that we can do that in a... Uh, in a responsible way that helps customers and the Australian economy uh, sensibly and rapidly move to a you know, lower carbon economy. I'd like to move on because we could talk about this for hours and we've got a lot of other customer questions. Another theme that's come up very strongly among your customers is customer service, particularly around call centres. So you might be in the hot seat in a mm. minute, Angus, but <laughs> Matt, um, Jason, Derek and Mukesh have all asked questions around Jason's one gets to the point. How does one get good customer service? The local banks are limited in what they can do, but the call centres, your call centres, are often, is, sorry, the, the call centre is often difficult to get through to, and when one can, the level and quality of service is substandard. Well, uh, look, An Angus can talk a little bit more about some of the things that we've been working on. I, I guess what I would say from the outset, particularly in terms of wait times at various points uh, over the course of the year, they haven't been good enough. And to anyone who's had to uh, wait uh, for a long time on the phone, both Angus and I would like to apologise. You know, in the context of we've added probably a thousand uh, staff into our contact centres, and you can imagine because there are far fewer people that are coming into a face-to-face -face environment, there's been a rapid shift into digital and using our mobile app, but also more people have called. We've also put a lot of effort into supporting customers who needed financial assistance over the last 18 months. <coughs> We've seen a big increase, unfortunately, and maybe we can talk about this later, Helen, in, in terms of uh, scams and fraud and they tend to be uh, much longer calls. That said, uh, we, we regret not being able to answer more of our calls uh, faster. Uh, Angus and the team have been hugely focused on both adding resourcing and making a number of different changes so that we can make sure we can deliver you know, a much better customer proposition 
uh, in the months ahead. And Angus, maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, happy to. Uh, maybe to, to Matt's apology as well, look, for, for any customers who've had to wait a longer time than, than you would have normally, I really apologise. It's been a huge focus area for us and perhaps I can help with a little bit of context on what we're doing to make sure that the situation's rapidly improving, which over the last uh, two weeks or so it has been. So a couple of things happened, as Matt mentioned, uh, as we entered into COVID, we saw a dramatic uh, demand for customers to need support, especially customers who entered into a home loan deferral. There are about 158,000 or so that we needed to help individually with each of those deferrals. And then two other things have been happening. Uh, one, which I'm sure some of you have unfortunately experienced firsthand, and if not your family and friends have, there's been a real rise in scams and it takes us quite a lot of time to work through with the victims of the scams, what's happened, unpack it for them, try and recoup money for them where we can. And in addition, which I'm sure some of you have unfortunately experienced as well, uh, disputes with travel arrangements as people entered into, as COVID hit us, uh, plans changed and things moved around, people weren't getting money back that they might have expected, lodged a dispute with the bank. So three uh, really big factors that all came together at once. As Matt mentioned, we've been very, very busy uh, moving people between our branches and our contact centres and into the teams that help customers that need financial assistance. Uh, we've been working tirelessly uh, to bring more people on board. We've hired hundreds and hundreds of new staff to bring them on board, as well as worked with some external partners to give us extra resources to support you. And we're doing even more work over the past couple of weeks to improve it. So uh, know that, that it is our highest priority to make sure that we offer you the highest service. And as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, apologies to those of you who we haven't been able to the answer the phones as quickly as we would have liked to. So, Angus, are you saying, did you say 168,000 people needed to have their loans deferred? And that all came through the call centres? That's right, 100, 158,000 158, customers. Uh, we initially started, we had a lot of customers who expressed uh, an intention to take up a deferral online, which was very helpful. But then in the process of working that through, we spoke to basically every customer that ended up with a deferral. And as a result, they're, yeah. they're very emotional discussions for a lot of Australians. It was a very difficult time and people are uncertain. They want to understand the options that are available to them and make sure that they're uh, supported as well as they can be. And as I'm sure you'll all appreciate, we, we placed a priority on making sure we could support those customers who were in a real position of stress and difficulty and offer them the support that they needed. It, it's interesting. I mean, obviously, customers, all of us, when we're a customer of, of one thing or another, we think, oh, why isn't it perfect and why aren't I getting the best service? And I'm not, um, you know, I'm not saying it's excusable, but it is interesting and it's good to hear those sort of explanations because, you, you know, when you're on the end of the phone, you think, what the heck is going on? Why is there nobody there? But, of course, you, you've had a massive increase in numbers of calls going through those call centres. Presumably the bank, too, was, was hit by some people not being able to come to work and that sort of thing. So Absolutely. thank you for that. But there are still some more questions on this area. Um, Elaine has asked a question, Matt, about you say that the post office is acting for Commonwealth Bank customers. However, when I try to take out cash from my account, the post office, the branch, mm -hmm. has not the funds to cover what Elaine wants to take out. Surely the post office could keep an account which would be available for customers, your customers, each day. Otherwise, your claim is not a valid one. Yeah, look, it's a really helpful question. And one of the things that we would say is, look, we think it's really important that we have, and we do, have the largest branch network in, in the country. But the number of physical points of presence or branches ac across Australia has reduced uh, as there's a lot less reliance on cash across a range of different factors. Part of what we do rely on uh, is the 3,500 uh, Australia Post outlets. I mean, generally speaking, we, you know, we get very good support from Australia Post, but just like we occasionally have some uh, service issues, if customers such as Elaine, uh, and I'm sure we're following that, this up, if we can get the specifics on that post office, then I'm sure that we'll be able to support that on a, on a more reliable basis. We do think that uh, Australia Post service model provides a, you know, an important point of convenience for our customers. We, of course, uh, pay for access to that network to support our, the largest uh, branch network and the largest uh, ATM fleet in the country. 
on from branch closures. Uh, both Eric and Dennis have asked questions around, around this area. But Dennis says, CBA and banks in general have moved away from bankers able to make informed decisions to an episode of Little Britain. Excuse my, um, you know, computer says no. Does CBA envisage this trend reversing or getting worse, given the continued closures of branches nationwide? Well, I think overall, as customer preferences have changed, and we've seen pretty dramatic, uh, of course, changes during COVID, but reductions in, in cash have been happening really for the last uh, 20 years. Um, and so that's put, uh, I guess, more pressure on branch networks around the country, across the industry. So I, I think, realistically, that is likely to continue. I do think, of course, though, um, yes, technology plays a really important role and provides a lot of convenience that you know, the vast majority of our customers feel very comfortable using frequently. We do try to provide a lot of insights and you know smarts in the technology, but there's no replacing uh, human interactions, particularly for complex needs and lending decisions. So, I mean, I've heard variations on that before that, um, uh, you know, bankers of today have got less delegation or less authority than they had in the past. I think in many cases that's not the case, but we certainly, like m many industries, try to use technology to understand our customers, uh, you know, better and, of course, try to provide a more streamlined uh, service proposition. I know in, in our business banking, for example, you know, customers who bank with us get a faster turnaround time and faster decisioning. Some of that's done in an automated fashion, but some of that, of course, is reliant upon people who can make uh, expert decisions. Angus? Yeah, I was just going to add uh, to the question. Uh, we've actually grown quite substantially, both our um, bankers who look after our customers' home lending needs and our business bankers. Both of those, I know, for the on the home lending front, we'd be up a good seven or 800 over the last five years, and all of those are located physically either in a branch or our mobile bankers who can come and visit customers at home. I think exactly to the spirit of the question, there is a persistent desire for a lot of our customers to, to talk to a banker about their more complex needs, and we're definitely responding that with a, a growth in headcount in those areas. I do want to ask you a fairly pointed question from customer Richard. Matt, given your commitment to customer satisfaction, please can you tell me when you or a member of your executive team last phoned the ComBank helpline or call centre? And if you can recall that, what sort of experience was it? Yeah, I, I mean, I do call regularly for exactly the same reason that the and Angus and I uh, trade both emails and calls about our various service levels. So, I mean, of course we do. And that's why I think uh, earlier we were both saying that at various points in time in the year, we would have been, we would have much preferred to be in delivering a you know, better quality of service. I, certainly my own experience, actually, when I get through the service quality is excellent. But as we talked about earlier, sometimes there have been, um, you know, a bigger increase in calls and we should have been able to respond to that more rapidly. We do feel that we're in a much better position uh, at the moment to be able to answer calls much, much faster and in line with our customers' expectations. And that's really important for us uh, in, in the future. And uh, again, just reiterating, if anyone has had a bad experience on the contact centre, we're certainly very focused on making sure uh, that's uh, much higher quality in the year ahead. I want to move on. A big issue, of course, is lending, particularly for home mortgages. A lot of customers, it's of huge interest. So let's start with Jay's question. We're loyal customers and want to refinance dollar for dollar our existing CBA loans through CBA instead of with another institution. We see new to bank customers are offered many more options than loyal customers. Why? And this comes up a, mm. a, a fair bit. There's a few questions here about why do um, home loan rates, uh, you know, often if you're a new customer, you get better, sorry, interest rates on, on not so much lending, but on deposits. But can you answer that question from Jay? I can. And, you know, Angus, you should feel free to comment as well. It's a huge focus for us to make sure we're supporting our customers' home buying needs. We're very fortunate to be able to serve you know, one in four Australians with that, you know, very important uh, purchase. So, we're very focused on making sure that pricing is competitive for existing customers as much as it is for new customers. I mean, home lending has become a, 
you know, a very competitive industry over many years. And, and there are lenders, including ourselves at various points in time, that are competing for new customers. We're very conscious of making sure that we're, you know, not creating an imbalance. Of course, we really uh, appreciate uh, customers who uh, stay with us for many years. And that's why there's a lot of effort that goes into making sure the pricing is uh, competitive and uh, we're doing our best to support our, our customers. As Angus said, we've added hundreds of lenders to just improve the overall uh, service proposition as well. But we also recognise that, of course, pricing is important uh, for our customers. Yeah, I was just going to add, JD, to your question. Um, all of, the, all of the products that we have on sale in the home lending space are available to new and existing customers. There's no product differences in what we put forward. Obviously, different customers have different choices around the products that they're most interested in. We, were, um, uh, we let out the remove to fixed rates. Uh, I guess it was about a year and a bit ago now, which have given Australians a huge opportunity to lock in uh, very low rates, historically low fixed rates. and. Many customers have taken advantage of those opportunities. So if there's something that we can pick up with you afterwards to make sure that you feel like you're in the right, right product, uh, happy to do that and we will. Can I just ask another one from Christian? A little bit along these lines. Um, having lost my job at the outset of COVID, I immediately looked at my personal situation and thought how I might restructure these loans, I presume Christian means, to give me breathing space. I was surprised and bitterly disappointed to hear from CBA that to restructure my loans, I would have to apply for new loans as if I was a new CBA customer and provide all of the associated documentation, including declaration of my loss of employment. All of my banking was done with CBA, as was my spending and credit history, but none of this counted. Mm. What can you do about this? Yeah, thanks for the question. Look, look obviously, uh, when customers reach a point of difficulty, it's appropriate for us to make sure, especially from a responsible lending perspective, that we understand your situation properly. And I know that at times, uh, whether it's with a new lend or when customers hit a position of difficulty, that can feel a little bit cumbersome. But the thoroughness of the process is very, very important to make sure we understand your circumstances and to make sure that we provide you with the solutions that are most appropriate. For some customers, there will be restructuring that can work. For others, if the problem is more substantial and everlasting, there are different paths that we need to take to make sure that we can support our customers well through that period. So, look, I, I apologise for if, if it felt cumbersome or in, in some ways heavy-handed, but it is really valuable and important that we understand your situation and we can evidence that that's a requirement that we have from a legislative perspective. Yeah, just to add to that, Helen, it's been such a focus for us to make sure, as you know, as Angus and I have said, more than 158,000 customers that we help with deferrals, deferral extensions, um, and being able to help customers through that period, we've announced that you know, we won't, won't be taking any enforcement activity into, uh, into 2022. And you know, one of the reasons why we've been able to work so closely and I think provide such great support is, is if we have great information from our customers and we're working very closely with them, it actually really enables us to, to help and support. We recognise that for many customers over the last 18 months, some can be facing financial difficulty, which is of completely outside of their control. I mean, it's been a you know, a very difficult period and that's been one of, the, I think, one of the most rewarding things for both of us and our teams is to have been able to help support so many customers through such a difficult time, which at least uh, to date, fortunately, the, the vast majority have been able to recover and you know, labour markets are looking strong and uh, I think the prospects for economic growth next year look very strong. So that's obviously a you know, very good situation to be in overall. Yeah, I, I guess you can see though how it can be so sensitive for people if they feel like I've done my banking with you all these years and you're asking me to resubmit everything it, it feels like an a sort of an invasion um, if you're a bit down or you've lost jo a job uh, and you don't have the same financial wherewithal as you had maybe a year before absolutely yeah I mean we recognize that and it's a very stressful time I think for anyone who is in uh, financial difficulty of course it's stressful and and our job is, is there to understand and support uh, our customers through that. And you know, I've been delighted with the number of customers we've been able 
uh, to help. But like anything, we'll continue to look for ways to to make that process even uh, you know simpler <coughs> and more uh, supportive of customers. Matt, this is not, it's still on home loan interest rates, but not necessarily on what we've just been talking about. Sunny would like to ask, the home loan interest rate has been remaining low. Do you foresee it will start to increase next year, so 2022? I'm not sure when Sunny submitted the question, but obviously there's been you know, a lot of movement uh, in, uh, in rates around the world. And the Reserve Bank uh, for Australia, which obviously sets the the cash rate. Uh, the governor recently said he uh, still didn't think rates were going to be increasing the official cash rate until uh, late in 2023. Uh, many economists, including the CBA economists, think that interest rates will be going up in terms of the official cash rate will be going up well before then. Our team believes it will be late next year. But you're seeing uh, effectively interest rates and funding markets respond. I mean, the Australian bond market has got uh, more than two uh, cash rate increases in uh, for next year. You've seen New Zealand, the cash rate's gone up, will continue to go up. Uh, many international markets. So I think the certainly the expectation of uh, higher interest rates uh, coming to Australia sooner than I think many people expect. So 2022, not necessarily 2023. That's what our economics team has got in for the November rate meeting. Um, um, modest increases, uh, but uh, as I said, the Reserve Bank is, is late 2023, so uh, one will be right. Uh, maybe it'll be somewhere in between. Who knows? Another issue of enormous interest among your customers <coughs> is branch closures. Now, we talked a little bit about that earlier, but some of these questions fall in, and Lynn and Donald and Robin have all asked questions about branch closures. But Donald's question is, why are you closing so many branches? The elderly are finding it harder to get to a branch with an ATM close by to be able to get their money. A lot of the elderly do not have access to the internet or do not want to use the internet and digital or phone banking. Yeah, I mean, look, I think as Angus said, during different times in COVID as well, we had temporary closures. We were reallocating parts of the network, obviously trying to support many more customers remotely. But also we've seen a number of branches close permanently during that time. And even and they'll that, never open again, is that...? that that's, that's right. I mean, certainly a, a subset of those, that's true. And, you know, we've communicated to... Uh, customers about that. And even though we have the largest branch network and we see uh, the big shift in terms of customer behaviour moving into online uh, and customers being much more comfortable and certainly less far less reliant on the branch network, the branches will uh, continue to be a really important part of the way we serve our customers. And we recognise and work through uh, at an individual basis uh, any of those decisions and for a for a customer that was visiting a particular branch if they're no longer able to visit that even if the nearest branch isn't far away or there's an Australia Post outlet I mean if it's less convenient then you know certainly some people uh, are not happy about that so we definitely try to balance all of those things I mean Angus can talk about some of the innovation that we've that we've trialed in certain markets around as we reduce both the um, the actual size of the branch and, and the way we're working with Australia Post and, of course, the, the ATM uh, network is an important part of that. But I think it's reasonable we see that in, in all around the world. Um, yeah. The number of physical branches uh, has reduced and um, customer behaviour and activity has dramatically shifted. But for all of those, you know, 90-odd percent of people who would be very comfortable shifting into that environment, there, of course, there are some who aren't. And, we try to do our best to make it uh, as easy and um, I guess as comfortable as that shift can be and try to help customers if they're not used to using the internet, feel safe and understand uh, the security features around that. But we also recognise that that can be quite a confronting challenge for some people. Yeah. Angus, just uh, um, to add to that, Carmine has said, you know, can you please ensure there will always be face-to-face -face customer service, actual stores? Well, Matt's just said that you will always have branches. And Stella Ann has said, why are the ATM machines being taken away? Mm. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, 
Maybe to connecting that question and one of the points that Matt was making, look, ultimately, and I, I accept that the generalisation may not be true for every individual customer, but the shift from doing things in person accelerated substantially through COVID and moved towards digital. And similarly, we've seen a dramatic reduction in the amount of cash that's being used in the economy. I think for many people, there was a desire to use less cash at, you know, during the COVID period. Uh, so, I, you know, I, I think those trends are unlikely to reverse. I think they're likely to continue and they obviously guide how we support our customers. Right, and we're, all, we're obviously investing more in our digital services over time. We're expanding that with new services like messaging. And, uh, you know, we two other thoughts that might be helpful for all of you. One, we do skew our branch closures urban. So if you think about it, we, we have more branches per customer in regional Australia. We, we obviously value the service that we offer to regional Australia and we know it's more distance travelled often to get from a regional town to another local centre to go into branches and we skew our branches to maintain more of them. And as Matt mentioned beforehand, uh, we have a very important partnership with Australia Post. We support them and ultimately we support a lot of Australia Post licensees in regional towns to be able to support those local businesses to provide that service that, that's that been very welcomed by many of the communities that I've spent time with personally, for them to have that extra revenue source coming into the franchise operation of the Australia Post in the local community. So we're very focused on it. We know that uh, different customers have different desires around how they interact with us and we want to make sure that we can support all of those different needs. Angus, associated with that issue really is about technology. There's a number of questions here. Jennifer, Harry, Ab Abhijit has all, have all asked about this, but Jennifer asks, how will you assist us seniors who either can't manage technology or can't afford a device? Why are you charging us 50-year customers to get out our money in the notes and coins we need? Hmm. I'll, have to, I'll have to take the specifics of the question there about why you're getting charged. I'll, I'll, I'll find out exactly and we'll follow up with you individually because that, that doesn't sound like it should be the case, especially if you're able to access any of the concessions that are available. That, that, that wouldn't be normal, so I'm happy to take that offline. Uh, and look, to, to, to the broader question there around technology and how can we support people, uh, we do a lot of different sessions and I, I'd really encourage you to speak to folks in your local branch. Uh, training sessions in branch to help you learn skills, especially staying safe online and scam avoidance. It's a really big focus area. It's scam awareness week this week. So take advantage of that. There's some great tools and resources out there. And the folks in our branches are always happy to help show you how to use. Uh, if you've got a new phone or an iPad or a piece of technology that you're using, you're very, very welcome to bring it in. We're happy to spend time helping you understand and get you set up so that if you do want to take advantage of that technology, and if you don't, you you're very welcome to come into branch or go into the Australia Post that's close to you and we can provide you that uh, in-person, face-to-face service. Matt Naraj has asked about regular online outages. Many times in the 13 years he's been a customer, many times we couldn't access NetBank and the app for a few hours. The bank never explained any reason behind it. In this forum, I hope you will explain this, as many customers are concerned about cyber safety of their accounts during these outages. Well, firstly, I appreciate uh, banking with us for 13 years. I won't, even though I've been with the bank for more than 20 years, I won't go through each of uh, any of the technology issues over that time. But, I mean, other than to say that we recognise how important it is to provide continuous uh, reliable service to our customers and you know, any interruption to that service, whether that be on NetBank or the ComBank app or on payments, at any point in time or regardless of what the cause of that is, is of course, you know, of deep regret and something that we're hugely focused on. We're investing more than $1.5 billion each year in technology. We're developing a lot of new products and services. We're definitely trying to innovate rapidly and we really want to have the best technology experience. Uh, in Australia, bar none, and certainly in financial services. You know, occasionally things do go wrong. That doesn't make it OK. Uh, a big part of what we're focused on is making sure that uh, things like uh, those critical applications, as I said, uh, their service isn't interrupted. So, I mean, it's certainly deeply regrettable from our perspective. Uh, you shouldn't worry about any connection uh, with cyber that hasn't been a factor in any of the service interruptions that we've had. But we're hugely focused on, of course, protecting 
uh, our customers, keeping them safe. I think it's one of the reasons why people do bank with CBAs because it's such a, you know, it's a trusted brand. Uh, there's things like our fraud guarantee. And so we want to, of course, continue to provide that, but in an uninterrupted way. And it's a, a huge focus for us uh, in the year ahead to make sure that notwithstanding you know, the big shift into digital that we continue to provide such a, you know, a reliable and because it is a very convenient service and we see that as a, as a real point of difference into the future. We did receive a number of questions around interest rates. We talked briefly earlier about mortgage interest rates, but Maureen and Geoffrey have asked um, about this in particular. And Maureen's question is, why are the term deposit rates so low? I, I know you've been asked that a number of times over the last few years. Why are the term deposit rates so low when your profits remain high? You cannot blame COVID-19 as your profits were still high even before the pandemic. Yeah, look, I, I think that th this question, and as you said, Helen, we've had a, a lot of uh, questions like this, and you know, I know that the Reserve Bank gets similar questions in terms of where the cash rate is. And you know, when you've got an official cash rate of 0.1%, which of course is unheard of in, in the Australian context, uh, that's put a lot of pressure, uh, downward pressure on interest rates. Uh, and that's really hurt depositors who are either you know, used to their term deposit being a source of income or their saving. And you're right, that's been one of the very strong themes for many years as interest rates have been coming down now for many years. But I think particularly over the last few, we've had more than five interest rate cuts uh, over that period. And so, I mean, it's a little bit like gravity with the interest rate coming down. You can't really offer a, a, you know, an interest rate for a deposit. Can much you, above where the cash rate is. Yeah. Do you mind just being, can you explain <coughs> in, in a really simple language about what is that connection between, say, the, the cash rate and what you can um, give to people? Because Jeffrey's question was about that, but it's, you know, self-funded <coughs> retirees are really feeling the pinch. Yeah, well, I mean, obviously, as interest rates come down, and, and I won't go into all the intricacies, but many of the rates are sort of pegged to the, uh, the official cash rate, or at least that's a proxy. And so... I think rates have come down by 500 points or so in, or more in the last mm. 10 years that's come through into, into depositors. And that's why, I mean, uh, it's one of the reasons why the housing market is so strong because the interest rate environment has come down. And of course, you know, you can borrow. And Angus talked earlier about uh, some of the fixed rate prices that have been available at you know, low twos, um, which for many people, probably the same people who are feel, really feeling it on the, um, you know, less than 1% on their term deposit, they also would remember paying you know, high uh, interest rates on home loans in the 80s and early 90s into you know, well into, into double figures. But the, the interest rate environment has just changed dramatically. Yeah. And I, I mean, clearly interest rates are, you know, will uh, increase. Um, and the pace of that, of course, is uncertain. But the, until that happens, there's unlikely, unfortunately, to be much respite uh, <coughs> for savers. All right. Well, on the other hand, Greg and Neil have both asked about very high rates on interest rates on credit cards. <coughs> Greg asks, why in these very trying times are credit card interest rates still so high? How about some relief? The banks, including yours, are charging too high rates. Give us all a break. Yeah, and look, this uh, credit cards and... Um Products like that is one of the areas that we've been really focused on. And you know, we've brought out, of course, low rate cards and we've got um, instalment facilities uh, linked to uh, credit card debt, which is a much lower interest rate than just a, you know, a standard uh, awards card. Uh, you know, and Angus and I have worked closely on a number of the products that we've brought to market, including uh, StepPay. Uh, which is a product that we launched uh, recently, which is like a buy now, pay later link to a debit card. So I think what we're trying to do is obviously balance out a number of different products that meet customers with different needs. Clearly, if you have anything more than a short term uh, finance requirement, then, you know, credit card, because it's priced differently because of the risks associated with credit card lending, it's not the right product for you. There's a range of other products that are, that are more suitable. Uh, and there are obviously uh, either in branch or certainly on the contact centre and or on our website, uh, I think lots of information hopefully to help uh, customers and for us to be able to support uh, customers and meet their needs most appropriately. 
I want to move on. We've still got, uh, we're limited in our time and we've got a lot of issues. A number of your customers are interested in COVID and your vaccination policy. Anita, Rochelle, Carmel have all asked about this, but I'll um, ask Rochelle's question. I've been a customer for over 35 years and if you continue to mandate your staff must be vaccinated, I will be taking my business elsewhere. Medical coercion is disgusting and unnecessary. Yeah, so, I mean, uh, let's talk about the COVID overall, particularly around vaccinations. I mean, we have been very supportive of the vaccination program. We've made it very easy and convenient for our staff to get vaccinated. Um, we've run our own corporate vaccination program. We've put a whole range of things in place to support our people. More than 90% of our people uh, intend and are rapidly getting vaccinated. We've reached 90%, obviously, in New South Wales uh, today. We, we anticipate it'll probably be something like uh, 96 or 97% uh, in totality. Obviously, in some states, uh, the state governments have made it a requirement um, to be entering into either workplaces or in, uh, in areas where you're serving customers. Look, we thought a lot about this topic. Um, the vast majority of our people, and one of the things that we need to put at the forefront of our thinking is how do we best protect our teams uh, and, of course, our customers. And on that basis, we've um, communicated to our teams that you know, on a different series of dates, we expect that customers to be able to return into uh, corporate premises will require vaccinations. Um, we anticipate a very, very small number of people who don't have medical exemptions and don't have a temporary set of circumstances will uh, not want to get vaccinated. And I think actually that number continues to reduce each day because we continue to see not just the you know, further evidence on the safety, but also the stunning, stunningly successful um, results that we're getting as a country and as a, uh, you know, as a the broader uh, population in terms of you know vaccination uh, versus uh, unvaccinated. Uh, another question around COVID, but not about vaccination. Jonathan has asked: COVID's proved that it's possible to be flexible with remote working. Is Combank considering or open to considering promotion of decentralised work environments, hybrid work, people working all different sorts of ways, but still with perhaps the customer coming first? Yes, absolutely. And I think this is another area where, I mean, certainly COVID accelerated um, people's willingness and uh, flexibility to be able to support that. We've all worked in that environment, um, particularly, you know, in states that have had considerable uh, lockdowns. And so, you know, we anticipate we'll be offering that indefinitely. Uh, I mean, the vast majority of our people even in Sydney are not currently in, you know, in the office. We do anticipate um, during the course of next calendar year that you know, the, most people will be coming in a couple of days a week. But of course, we want to support uh, flexibility, provide um, the best work environment to be able to support our people and, of course, deliver great outcomes for our customers. Matt, there were a number of questions around, well, I'm going to call it broadly financial assistance, but a lot of them were about personal requests and complaints. So I'm not going to read the, oh, well, the complaints, happy to. But Eva has asked, I'd like to know more about how you're helping customers and members of the community impacted by domestic and domestic violence and financial abuse achieve long-term financial independence. Hmm. It's been a, uh, an area of focus for us for many years and initially we started out um, supporting customers in a crisis situation, really responding to an emergency situation. More recently, uh, we've established something we call the Financial Independence Hub in a partnership with Good Shepherd, which is really about being able to provide access to uh, expert coaches and counselling services, in some cases uh, no interest uh, loans to be able to support customers more sustainably over the medium term. We were able to help more than 20,000 20, customers, uh, largely those who were um, looking to escape and re-establish a different life who were victims of, of domestic and family violence. It's of course um, very regrettable that it's an issue uh, in the community, but it absolutely is. And what we see is financial abuse tends to um, be associated with uh, violence uh, in about 90% of cases. And so 
We think there's an important role for the Commonwealth Bank uh, to play, um, to be able to support our customers. Of course, we have you know, a range of different policies and education in place for our own people, for our own staff, at more than 40,000 team members. It's unlimited leave uh, for victims of domestic and family violence and uh, uh, a week's leave to be able to support someone uh, uh, who's in those circumstances. So it's a really important, it's something that the, the team feel very passionately about. Um, unfortunately, you know, many people have been impacted or know someone who has, and we feel that it's only right that we're uh, doing everything we can to support customers uh, in, in that sort of circumstance. Angus, if I could ask you, turning to account fees, a number of questions here, but Ernie and Nicole have asked questions along these lines. Ernie's question is, I've been a loyal customer for over 20 years, therefore, why is it that I am paying any account and credit card charges at all? Sure. Ernie, thanks for the question. Uh, look, you know, we, we've done a lot of work over the years to remove a number of fees that were pain points for customers. Uh, some of you will remember the uh, ATM fees that were once charged a number of years ago. They've all since been abolished. The vast, vast majority of our customers pay absolutely no monthly account keeping fee for getting their uh, banking with us. And look, you know, in, in some instances, there are fees that customers pay. Um, Certainly, and Matt mentioned before, the interest rate environment that we find ourselves in at the moment, uh, you know, banking on the whole for most customers is very, very, very low cost. When you think about the option to deposit your money into a bank, uh, access at all of our ATMs for free, uh, use our mobile app and digital services, our branches, contact centres. We don't charge for any of that service experience on the whole. And so there are some areas where we charge fees to cover the costs that we incur uh, and make sure that we can continue to offer the great services that we offer. But I'm happy to, you know, if there are specific things that have caused you challenge, I'm very happy to pick them up and I will with the team afterwards. There is a question from Leslie. I've been a loyal customer for 61 years. I'm very annoyed that if my account goes over, say, with a direct debit, they charge me $15. And as soon as I see it, I deposit the money in straight away. Is this any way to treat a loyal customer? Yeah, Leslie, thank you for the question. We, we, we did make a change. I'm, I'm not sure uh, how recently this happened to you. Uh, probably about 18 months, no longer ago now, a couple of years ago, where we alert all customers if their account's going to go overdrawn on the day that that transaction happens. Uh, and the alert message is basically a message that says, hey, uh, please just drop in a little bit of extra money into your account so that you can avoid going overdrawn uh, and avoid the fee that's charged. And that, that's been obviously really well received by our customers on the whole to make sure that they can keep their account in order and avoid those unnecessary fees. Matt, I'd like to move on. There's a couple of questions about corporate responsibility, but I just want to put one to you from Tony, and that gives a flavour of what a few people have asked about. Who gave you the right to share my data with third-party telcos and service providers? I never authorised the bank to do this, yet now you boast about it. Seems arrogant in the extreme to take my privacy away without asking permission. Yeah, no, thank you. It's a, it's a really important question and we don't provide our customers data. We don't sell it. We don't provide it to third parties. Um, when we do talk about it, which I'm assuming um, you're referring to the, some of the partnerships that we've got, uh, Angus mentioned earlier, uh, Amber Electric. Um, we have a partnership with More Telecom. I mean, we do think one of the important things that we can do is provide greater value to our customers or across a range of different uh, products and services, of course, our own, but also identify opportunities for them. Understanding our customers' needs and being able to anticipate those needs, it's imp I think it's very important that we do study and analyse uh, what our customers are doing and how we can better serve them. But you should rest assured that we, we don't provide that data uh, to third parties. It's, it's not a, something that we're uh, contemplating doing. I want to move on to... Combank rewards and awards. I'm a bit confused about them, but a, a couple of your customers have asked, Devita has says, can we have more support to get more and regular discounts or rewards when we use our card in shops for our groceries with Coles, Woolies, or when we shop with Target, Kmart, Kmart Big W or Meyer? Yeah, look, it's a big focus and um, you know, Angus and I spend quite a bit of time on, on the Combank Rewards program. It's proven to be very popular and it's a, it's a good example actually of understanding 
what sort of uh, offers that can be uh, provided to customers in our uh, mobile app experience actually are valued by customers. And so I know in my mobile experience at the moment, one of them's a, a JB Hi-Fi uh, offer. If you spend, I think it's over $60, you get a five or $10 cash back off. And so we see part of what we're trying to build out in our digital experience of providing a more rewarding experience. Uh, the, the ComBank Awards is the points that are associated with your credit cards. Right. Rewards is uh, an offering that we uh, put within our mobile banking experience. We've also rolled out or we've, um, a partnership with Little Birdie, which is a, you know, a, a shopping and deals uh, process because we, we want to deliver the, you know, the richest and, and highest quality shopping experience for our customers. It's just a, one of a number of ways that we want to be able to deliver not just a, you know, a better experience, banking with ComBank, but also uh, real value into our, into our customers' uh, lives. And a sort of an associated question comes from, comes from Cynthia. I was a staff member of ComBank for a number of years, initially started banking with the Commonwealth through school. The bank has never had to contact me about overdrawn accounts, unpaid accounts, etc., etc. Yet this has never been recognised in any way. I think it would be appropriate to have some sort of reward system in place for customers who've conducted their dealings with the bank in an exemplary manner over a number of years. Angus, do you want to have a... I'm, I'm happy to start off. Agree and th thank you for your, your question and, and obviously your time working at the bank. We do have something very exciting coming early in the new year. It's, it's feedback that we've received uh, from different customers over the years of finding a way for us to be able to appreciate... Uh, you know, you banking with us for a long time and make sure that we give some value back to you. Um, definitely, especially, I think it was Cynthia who had the question about the uh, rewards offers. Make sure, uh, just check online that you're opted in to receive those offers. They're, they're great value. We've been able to put tens of millions of dollars back in the hands of customers as cash back reward when they've spent money. So just check that you're um, signed up to get those and definitely on the on the loyalty and appreciation front watch this space we've got a lot coming and we certainly use those reward offers and the other things that are in the app at the moment as a way to be able to appreciate uh, all of you for banking with us we're fast running out of time but i do want to ask you about innovation You've made some very big announcements just seemingly in recent days and weeks. The Buy Now, Pay Later product mm -hmm. you mentioned, Step Pay. You've moved into cryptocurrency. Uh, you've just yesterday announced a major tie-up to improve your app experience for customers with the, I think, their Silicon Valley-based artificial intelligence company, H2O.ai. Mm -hmm. um, but there are a number of complaints as well about this, so I might get those out first. UE has said, is CBA pushing for a cashless future? I take that as a complaint, I think. Yeah, I'd see it as a, quite a different question, uh, Helen. Look, no, I mean, I think we, we certainly believe that uh, electronic payments and there'll be less cash in circulation. I don't think cash is disappearing anytime soon. Uh, a, a number of the innovations that you read out, um, a, a huge focus for us. We, we want to provide the most innovative products and services to our customers. We want to have the best technology uh, in the country. and We want to be able to really differentiate the experience of banking with CBA uh, through that. They're, they're very different, obviously, products and services between buy now, pay later, which is more everyday payments, crypto, which is, of course, uh, you know, uh, a very volatile investment, but we're, we're seeing uh, strong demand uh, across the country, and so we want to offer a, you know, a, a safe and trusted service for our for our customers there. And sorry, that service is you can't pay for things with crypto, but you can trade your yes, cryptocurrency. The, the, that's right. There's there's uh, a lot of the interest has really been at, at the moment in terms of gaining access to the asset class and yeah. making it as an investment. It is, of course, very volatile, but more recently the prices have uh, gone up quite sharply. At least initially we're, uh, uh, we'll be enabling uh, customers to invest or, or purchase uh, 10 different uh, cryptocurrencies or, or, or coins that will be available in our, in our mobile banking experience. We'll certainly turn our minds in the future about whether we think there's broader applicability, but um, you know, I think it's a very interesting space. Clearly, there's a lot of demand, and we want to make sure, that, again, we're on the forefront of, of delivering uh, innovative products and services to customers.
Well, as you would know, and you've just really alluded to, a lot of people don't understand it, and it's still fairly new, a lot of your customers. Robert has actually said, I'm surprised and disappointed CBA is getting involved in cryptocurrency. Are you aware of those who've been involved in court cases and they've lost because of the ups and downs of crypto? Are you aware of the dangers? Extremely. And, I mean, look, to your point, Helen, I think there's, you know, based on our research, we think there's about 8 or 9% of the population. Uh, but we, if you work that out, that's about 2 million people who are, who are in it. Who are in it. Another 5% or so considering uh, to From our perspective, and uh, the question's quite right, it's a very volatile investment. And one of the things that we make clear uh, for customers if they would like to invest is only be prepared to invest what you can afford to lose. Um, but we do believe that the sector itself will be important and relevant uh, for many years and we want to um, make sure we can support customers as I said with a you know a safe and credible and trusted offering um, and uh, that's something that we'll be piloting uh, later this year and looking to expand uh, if that goes well uh, next year. We didn't get any questions on this because it was only yesterday the announcement about H2O.ai. Can you just be really brief and give us a picture of what you want to do to the app experience for customers? Well, very briefly, it's all about making a, a more personalised and relevant experience to our individual customers. And H2O.ai and, and AI more generally is really about you know, more advanced statistical techniques that actually help drive that personalization and I mean within our mobile app experience at the moment we to give you a sense of the proportionality we, we analyze uh, 157 billion data points in real time uh, and there's that's uh, just one of the I guess ways that we sort of power that experience to make it better and relevant provide more value to uh, customers and and better serve them and we need to be prepared to invest in technologies that will help us do that. I think we have run out of time. I've, I've let it go over a little bit. That is all we have time for. Matt, would you like to make a few closing remarks? Yeah, very briefly, and only because we didn't get any questions on scams and fraud. We did, and I, I missed asking you no, about that, them. That, that's OK. I'm just, we're very conscious of it because we're seeing a, you know, a very large increase um, <coughs> across the economy. I, I saw some research recently. Um, I think about 80% of Australians would, would have had someone attempt to scam or fraud them, generally to mobile phones with yep. uh, SMS messages, particularly in the lead up to Christmas, people purporting to be you know, delivery services, uh, you know, network technicians. We see a lot of sophistication where people are basically being convinced to hand over their net code SMS or their login details. Uh, it's a very stressful experience for, for customers. There's some very sophisticated people who unfortunately uh, you know, look to prey uh, on people. And I, th I think what we just add is um, for people to just be extremely wary uh, and extremely reluctant to hand over any of their, uh, of their personal information. I think it's in incredibly important at, at all times, but particularly at this time of the year and the lead up to Christmas where a lot of people would be doing shopping and taking deliveries and... Yeah. Well, Rose and Ross Alba have both asked questions about this and I, I did leave them out, not, not on purpose, just because we were running out of time. So Rose actually asked, how can I improve the security of my credit card and, and, and what can I do? So you've just mostly answered that. But would the bank ever ask anyone, say in a text to, oh, you know, give us your full no. details? No, No, you never. never ask no. that, would you? And when, even in the mobile app it says, do, you know, do not give your net code. Don't pe people yep. will deliberately target or pretend to be someone? Often it's it could be another sort of service provider. Um, I've seen a whole range of different um, scams there. Of course, we invest in trying to make sure we're protecting our customers and detecting fraudulent transactions and alerting them. And I know that's been uh, you know a very popular feature for our customers and something we're hugely focused on making sure that we have you know a very secure and trusted experience for our customers. Thank you. Thank you, Matt and Angus. It's really been great that you've answered all those questions. I think we got through uh, a great number of your questions. Thanks to all of you who sent through questions for Matt. Now, a replay of the forum will be available on combank.com.au forward slash CEO.
later tomorrow. A special thank you to everyone for watching the Forum Live. We do appreciate your time. You'll receive a feedback survey in the next few days. Good night.